Hello, hello, and welcome to my channel. Um, I'm going to read the rest of chapter one of the Silver Eyes. Yeah. Father did not look up from his work. Daddy, she said again more urgently, and this time he turned to her slowly, as though, <laughs> as though not fully present in the world. What do you need, sweetie? She pointed to the mouse skeleton. Does it hurt? She wanted to ask the question, but when she looked into her father's eyes, she found she could not. She shook her head. Nothing. He nodded at her with an absent smile and went back to work. Behind him, the teacher gave another awful twitch. Its eyes still burned. Charlie shivered and drew back her, er, drew herself back to the present. She glanced behind her, feeling exposed. She looked down and her gaze, her gaze fixed on something. Three widely spaced grooves in the ground. She kneeled. Thoughtful and ran her fingers over one of them. The gravel was scattered away, then marked one heavily into the front into the dirt. A camera tripod of some sort it was the first unfamiliar unfamiliar thing thing she seen. The door to the workshop was cracked open slightly inviting, but she felt no desire to go inside. Quickly she headed back to a car. But she stopped, stopped as soon as she settled into the driver's seat. Her keys were, perhaps, were gone, probably having fallen over, fallen out of her pocket somehow, somewhere inside the house. She traced the steps, merely glancing into the living room and kitchen before heading up to her bedroom. The keys were on the wicker chair beside Theodore the Rabbit. Theodore the Rabbit. She picked them up and dangled them for a moment, not quite ready to leave the room behind. She sat down on the bed. Stanley the unicorn had stopped beside the bed as she always did, and as she sat, she sat it absolutely on the head. It had grown dark while she was outside, and the room was now cast in shadows. Somehow, without the bright sun sunlight, the toy's flaws and deterioration was thrown into sharp relief. Theodore's eyes no longer showed, and his thin fur and keen ear made him look like a sickly vagabond. Like when she looked down at Stanley, the rust around his eyes made them look like hollow sockets, and he bared teeth, and his bare teeth, which she had always thought of as a smile, but could it became the awful knowing grin of a skull. Charlie stood up, careful not to touch him, and hurried towards the door, but her foot caught in the wheel beside the bed. She tripped on the track and fell sprawling to the floor. There was a pair of, of, there was a whirl of spinning metal, and as she raised her head, a small pair of feet appeared under her nose, clapped clad in shining patient leather. She looked up. There there above her was El Ella staring down at her, silent as uninviting uninviting, her glassy eyes almost appearing to see. The teacup and saucer were held out before her with a military stiffness. Charlie got up cautiously, taking care not to disturb the doll. She left the room, step, step, stepping carefully to avoid accidentally activating any other toys. As Charlie went, Ella retreated to a closet, almost matching her pace. Charlie hurried down um, the stairs, seized by an urgency to get away. In the car, she fumbled the key three times before sliding into place. She backed too fast down the driveway, running recklessly over the grass of the front yard and sped away. After a mile, after about a mile, 
Charlie pulled over on the shoulder and turned off the car, turned the car off, staring straight ahead through the windshield. Her eyes focused on nothing. She forced herself to breathe slowly. She reached up and adjusted the real flat view mirror so she could see herself. She always expected to see pain, anger, and sorrow written on her face, but they never were. Her cheeks were pink and her round face looked almost cheerful, like always. Her first weeks living with Aunt Jen, she heard the same things over and over when Aunt Jen introduced her. What a pretty child, what a happy looking child she is. Charlie always looked like she was about to smile, her brown eyes wide and sparkly, her, mouth, her thin mouth ready to curve up when she wants to sob. The incongruity with mild betrayal, she ran her figures through her light brown hair as though that was magically thick. It's slight frenziness and put a mirror, put the mirror back into position. She turned the car back on and searched for radio station, hoping that the music might bring her fully back to reality. She flipped from station to station, not really hearing what any of them were playing, and finally settled on an AM broadcast with a host who seemed to be yelling condescendingly to his audience. She had no idea what he was talking about, but the brash and annoying sound was enough to jar her back into the present. The clock in the clock car was always wrong, so she checked her watch. It was almost time to meet her friends at the diner they had chosen near the center of town. Charlie pulled back onto the road and drove, letting the sound of an angry talk host. Uh, uh, talk radio host when, oh, yeah. time. when she reached the restaurant, Charlie put, pulled into the line, stop, but did not park. The front of the diner had a long picture window across it, and she could see right inside. Though she could not have that seen them for years, it took her only a moment to spot her friends. <laughs> Jessica was the easiest to pick out from the crowd. She always enclosed her letters, pictures with her letters. And right now she looked exactly like her last photo. Even seated, she was clearly taller than, I, than either of the boys and very thin. So Charlie could not see her whole outfit. She was wearing a loose white shirt with an embroidered vest. And she had a grooming hat perched on her glossy shoulder length brown hair with an enormous flower threatening, threatening to tip it off her head. She was generally excited at something she spoke, about something as she spoke. The two, two boys were sitting next to each other, facing her. Carlton looked like an older version of his red-headed child herself. He still had a bit of a baby face, but his features had refined, and his hair was carefully tousled and held in place by some alchemical hair products. He was also almost pretty for a boy, and he wore black work, workout shirt, though she, though she double, doubted he ever worked a day in his life. She slouched forward on the table, resting his chin in his hands. He slouched forward on the table, resting his chin in his hands. Beside him, John sat closest to the window. John had been the kind of child who got paint before he even went outside. There would be paint on his shirt before the teacher handed out the watercolors, grass stains on the knees before they came near a playground, and dirt under his fingernails just after he washed his hands. Charlie knew it was him because it had to be. He looked, but he looked completely different. A grubbiness of childhood had been replaced by something crisp and clean. He was wearing a neatly pressed light green button-down shirt, the sleeves rolled up and collar open, preventing him from looking too uptight. He was leaning back confidently in the bed, nodding enthusiastically, apparently absorbed in whatever Jessica was saying. The only concussion to his former self was his hair, sticking up all over his head. And he had a five o'clock shadow, a smug adult version of dirt he had always covered in, always covered in as a kid. Charlie smiled to herself. John had been something like a, of a, her childhood crush, 
before I didn't have really understood what that meant. He gave the cookies from his transformer lunchbox, and once in kindergarten, he took the blame for when she broke the glass jar that held colored art beads for art and crafts. She remembered the moment when it slipped from her hand, and she watched it fall. She could not have moved fast enough to catch it, but she would not have tried. She wanted to see it break. The glass hit the floor, and the shadow and and shattered into a thousand pieces and the beads scattered many color, colorful among the shards. Thought it was beautiful and she wanted to cry. Then she started to cry. Jonathan sent, sent home a note, sent, had a note sent home to her parents and when she told him thank you, he had winked at her for, with an irony beyond his ears and simply said, for what? After that, John was allowed to come to her room. She let him play with Stanley and Theodore, watching anxiously the first time he learned to press the button and make them move. She would, would be crushed if he didn't like them, knowing instantly that it would make her think less of him. They were her family, but John was fascinated as soon as he saw them. He loved her mechanical toys, and so she loved him. A few years later, behind a tree, tree beside her father's workshop, she almost let him kiss her. Then it happened, and everything ended, at least for Charlie. Charlie shook herself, forcing her mind back to the present. Looking again at Jessica's polished appearance, she glanced down at herself, bubble t-shirt, denim jacket, black jeans, and combat boots. It had felt like a good choice this morning, but now she wished she had chosen something else. This is all you ever wear, she reminded herself. She parked the car, parked and locked the car behind her, even though people in the hurricane, in, in hurricane, did, did not usually lock their cars. Then she went into the diner, diner to meet her friends for the first time in ten years. The warmth and noise and the light of the restaurant hid her in a wave as she entered. For a moment, she was overwhelmed, but Jessie saw her pause in the doorway and shouted her name. Charlie smiled and went over. Nice, she said ocularly, flicking her eyes at each of them, but not fully making contact. Jessica scooted over, her, over the red vinyl beach and patted the seat beside her. Here, sit, she said. I was just telling John and Carl Olten about my night glamorous life. She rolled her eyes as she said it, managing to convey both self-deprecation self and the fact that her life was truly something amazing. <laughs> something hi, exciting. Hi. Do you know Jessica lives in New York? Carson said. There was something careful about the way he spoke, like he was thinking about his words before forming them. John was silent. He smiled at Charlie anxiously. Jessica slowly rolled her eyes again, and with a flash of deja vu, Charlie suddenly recalled that this had been a habit even when they were child children. Eight million people live in New York, Carlton. It's not exactly a cheap one, Jessica said. Charlie shrugged. I've never been anywhere, he said. I didn't know you still lived in town, Charlie said. Where else am I going to live? My family has been here since 1896, he added, deeply in his voice to mimic his father. Is that even true? Trillia? I don't know, Carlton said in his own register. Could be. Dad runs for mayor two years ago. I mean, he's lost, but still. Who runs for mayor? He made a face. I swear. The day I turn 18, I'm out of here. Where are you going to go? John asked. Looking seriously, I called him. Carson by his eyes. Just as serious for a moment. Briefly, he broke away and pointed out the window, closing one eye as if to get his true arm, aim, his aim true. John raised an eyebrow as if, as, as he looked at the window, trying to follow the line Carson was pointing to. Charlie looked too. Carson wasn't pointing at anything. John opened his mouth to say something, but Carlton interrupted. Or, he said, 
as he's smoothly pointed in the opposite direction. Okay. John scratched his head, looking slowly embarrassed. Anywhere, right? He added with a laugh. Where's everyone else? Charlie asked, peering out of the window and searching for the parking lot for the new arrivals. Tomorrow, John said. They're coming tomorrow morning, Jessica jumped out in to clarify. Marla is bringing her little brother. Can you believe it? Jason. Jason? Charlie smiled. She remembered Jason as a little bundle of blankets with a tiny red face peeking out. I mean, he wants a baby around. Jessica said I'm, husband. I'm sure, pretty sure he's not a baby anymore, Charlie said. Practically a laugh. Practically a baby, Jessica said. Anyway, I booked us a room at the motel down by the hallway. It was all I could afford. Fine. The boys are staying with Carton. Okay, Charlie said. She was vaguely impressed by Jessica's organization, but wasn't happy about the plan. She was loath to share a room with Jessica, mm -hmm. who now seems like a stranger. Jessica had become the kind of girl who intimidated her, polished and immaculate, speaking as though she had everything in life figured out. For a moment, Charlie considered going back to her old house for the night. But as soon as she thought it, the idea would post her. That house at lot in night? No longer the providence of the living. <laughs> Don't be dramatic, she scolded herself. But now John was speaking. He had a way of commanding attention with his voice, probably because he spoke less often than everyone else. He spent most of his time listening, but not out of ref uh, reference. He was gathering information gathering information, speaking only when he had wisdom or sarcasm to dispense. Often, it was both at once. Does anyone know, know what's happening tomorrow? They were all silent for a moment, and the waitress pitched the opportunity to come over for the order. Charlie flipped quickly through the menu, her eyes not really focusing on her, her, the words. Her turn to her order came much faster than she was expecting. She froze. Um, hey, she said at last. The woman's hard expression was still fixed on her, and she realized she had not finished. Scrambled. Whoa! Toast, she added. And the woman went away. Charlie looked back at the down of the menu. She hated this about herself. When she was caught off guard, she seemed to lose. Uh, she seemed to lose all ability to act. And at, process, at, at, at process, or process what was going on around her. People were incomprehensive, their demands alien. Ordering didn't it shouldn't be this hard, she thought. The others had begun their conversation again and she turned her attention to them, feeling like she was half falling behind. What do we even say to his parents, Jessica would say. Carlton, do you ever see them? Charlie asked. Not really, he said. I get around again. Sometimes. I'm surprised they stayed in her game, Jessica said, with a note, note of worldly disapproval in her voice. Charlie said nothing, but she, she thought, how could they not? His body was never found. How could they, they not have secretly hoped he might not come home, no matter how impossible they, they knew it was? How could they leave their only home, Michael knew? It would mean, it would mean really, finally getting up on him. Maybe that was what the scholarship was, admission that he was never coming up. Charlie was ac accurately aware that they were in a public place where talking about Michael felt inappropriate. They were in a sense, both insiders and outsiders, they had been closer to Michael, probably more than anyone, anyone in his restaurant, but with the exception of Carson, they were no longer from Hurricane. They did not belong. She saw tears fall, falling on her on her paper pa placement before she felt them. She hurriedly wiped her eyes, looking down and hoping no one had noticed. When she looked up, John appeared to have been studying his silverware. But 
She knew he had seen. She was grateful to, to him for not trying to offer comfort. John, do you still write? Charlie asked. John had declared himself an author when they were about six, having learned to read and write when he was four, a year ahead of the rest of them. At the age of seven, he completed his first novel and possessed and pressed his poorly spelled, inscrutable illustrations, illustrated creations on his family and friends, friends and family, demanding reviews. Charlie remembered that she had given him only two stars. John laughed at the question. I actually do my E's the right way these days, he said. I can't believe you remember that. But I do actually, yeah, he said, clearly wanting to say more. What do you write? Carson obliged, and John looked down at his placement. Placement, speaking mostly to the table. Uh, so stories, mostly. I actually had one published last year. I mean, it was just in a magazine. Nothing big. They all made suitable noises of being impressed and looked up again. Embarrassed, but pleased. What was the story about? Charlie asked. John had to say. But before he could speak, he decided not to do it. The waitress returned with their food. They had all ordered from the breakfast menu coffee, eggs, and bacon. Blueberry pancakes. Cakes with color tints. The brightly colored food looked hopeful, like fresh start to today. Charlie took a bite, bite of her toast, and they they all ate family for a moment. Hey, Carlson, John said suddenly. What has happened to Freddy's anyway? There was a brief hush. Carlson looked nervously at Charlie, and Jessica stared up at the ceiling. John flushed red, and Charlie spoke hastily. It's okay, Carlton. I like to know tips. <laughs> Carlton shrugged, stabbing his pancakes nervously with his voice. They built over it, he said. They did. What did they build? Jessica asked. There was something else there now. Was it built over or torn down? John asked. Carlton shrugged again. Quick. Like the nervous tick. <laughs> like I said, I don't know. It's too far from the road to see, and I haven't exactly investigated. It might have been law at least to someone, but I don't know what they did. It's all been bottled, blocked off for years, under construction. You can't even tell if the building's still there. So it could still be there? Just gasped with a spice of excitement breaking through. Like I said, I don't know, Carlton answered. Charlie felt the dinner's fluorescent lights flaring down on her face, suddenly too bright. She felt exposed. She had barely eaten, but she found herself rising from the bed, pulling, pulling a few crumpled bills from her pocket and dropping them on the table. I'm going to go outside by now, she said. Smoke break, she added hastily. You don't want to smoke? You don't smoke. She chisels herself. For the clumsy lines she had made, made, made her way to the door, jostling past a family of four without saying, Excuse me, and stepped out into the cold evening. Cool evening. She walked to a car and sat on the hood. The metal did tune slightly under her waist. She took in the breath of the cold air as if it were water and closed her eyes. You knew it would come up. You knew what you would have to talk about it, she reminded herself. She had practiced from the drive to here, had forced herself to think back to happy memories, to smile, say, remember when? She thought when she was prepared for this, but of course she had been wrong. Why else would she have run out of the restaurant like a child? Charlie! She opened her eyes and saw John standing next to the car, holding her jacket out in front of him.